thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioners. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome and come to order. This is the February 3rd, 2020, 9 a.m. meeting of Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Glad to see everybody here this morning. Um, one quick note to start, uh, think about where you parked and what time it is, because the city of Graham does ticket. The mayor that yeah, we got right. the mayor here. I the first ticket. <laughs> so if you get a ticket, take it to Mayor Peterman. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right, and we're all here. Uh, Commissioner Sutton, Commissioner Boswell, I'm Chair Amy Gailey, Commissioner Lashley, and Vice Chair Carter. So, uh, Commissioner Sutton, would you mind please leading us in invocation uh, in the pledge? I sure don't. And if I may say something before I do, if, if there's anything I've learned, since I've been sitting up here, is how to do that. Often, offer an invitation in public, <laughs> pray in public, because I'll assure you I was not prepared to do it when I first got here. But thank goodness I've learned that talent. Maybe not talent, but so if we can take a moment, please. My heavenly Father, we have seen and heard all of our lives basically that we will never know the time of your return that there will be signs I don't know how much more can be out there for us to witness to be on that list of signs we still don't know the time of your return but help us all to be prepared on a lighter note here at home I think this sums it up a lot for me and what challenges we have ahead of us. A decade ago, you know that my grandson and I were in Fayetteville at Fort Bragg, walking up a sidewalk on Desert Storm Drive, looking at a wall that had about 11 to 1,200 names of Special Forces soldiers that had died in various operations around the world. He looked at the wall, you know it, he said, there's room for more. And I said, yes, I, you're right, and I'm afraid more names will go up there. And as poignant a statement as I've ever heard that covers everything in our lives, he said, if people would do right, you wouldn't have to do that. <clears throat> and I thought, how true. Help us to do right. Help us to know what is right. Be with us in our daily lives and help people around this world that need help. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have two public comment periods in our meeting. The first public comment period we're about to start is where um, people can address the board on matters, topics that are related to agenda items. The second public comment period is for non-agenda related items at the end of the meeting. We have a 30 minute total time allotted for um, public comments for each of those two slots. Uh, speakers on any item are limited to three minutes. Um, and we have a timer over there. So, and we have a, we're allowed uh, three speakers, if it's an agenda related item, three speakers in favor of the agenda related item and three speakers who may be opposed to the agenda item. So with that being said, um, we have a call up Mr. Tom Green. If you would come to the lectern please. And while he's coming forward, we do have uh, rules about the uh, public comment period which are available to be reviewed online. Okay, Mr. Green, when you're ready. Hello, good morning. Uh, good morning. My name's Tom Green. I live in the north end of the county. I'm nobody special, but I've lived here for 30 years. I uh, like my county. I like my sheriff. 
Uh, on the Second Amendment Sanctuary County Resolution, I personally don't feel under threat right at the moment, but there are everybody in Virginia and five big counties in this state that will eventually bring that problem to my doorstep. So I would really like to have this resolution put in place beforehand uh, when we don't need it instead of waiting until <coughs> we do and maybe not be able to do it at the time. And <coughs> that's about all i got to say. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. <coughs> okay, so the next on the list is Mac Williams. It says you want to talk about the sales tax. So that'll be at the end. And then um, Tom Stewart, the property for the school. Good morning. I didn't know your format, but I had pre prepared a presentation with PowerPoint. You don't get that. You get the, Thank you. the pieces of it. My name is Tom Stewart. I own some property on North Jim Minor Road that uh, perhaps would be uh, feasible for the, the school system. My property is about 10 acres. It adjoins the park on two sides. I don't know how many of you are familiar with North Jim Minor, but it uh, is between Highway 54 and 119. The points that if you, well, part of the reason that I think this is a, might be a good spot is that 119 has the Hallfield schools on one end and like Alexander Wilson on the other. So that road is, is has a lot of travel on it, um, to say the least. Uh, the property I have, like I said, is, is between the two. I think it's, it's 10 acres. There's two pieces of property that are in, are in front of it that would create problems or situation where it it doesn't allow you to get to the to the road to 119. So my, my piece of property, for lack of a better word, would be shaped like a flag with a 60-foot runway into it and then an open spot. And in front of that property is um, property that has a, a trailer that's got a right-of-way that owns by somebody else, is owned by somebody else, a big, a big triangle. So I have gone and spoke with the people who own that property and asked if whether or not they would consider selling it. They both are, are amenable to that. Um, the property um, is flat. Um, I've seen some of the construction work that's going on over at the park. And there seems like a lot of caterpillars working their way around. Um, this property is flat enough that if somebody wanted to come in to the school, put a parking lot, whatever would be needed, that the construction costs would be minimal. It, the property is probably a quarter mile from the industrial park. Uh, it's about a half of a mile from 119, probably a mile and a half from 54. Uh, so it's, it's an, in an ideal location. Again, the park is located right beside it. And so it would make sense to me and perhaps others that the facilities that currently belong to the park in the way of athletic fields and that sort of thing would be, would be uh, there. And you, there wouldn't be an additional expense in preparing those and the grading work and the construction costs that go along with it. Um, the property that adjoins me there in the front not only has, it's a, it's a double wide house, but it has a shop, a big shop. Um, probably if you had to put it in your front yard or your somewhere on your property, that shop would cost, I would imagine, $50,000. It's part of the, the piece right in front of me, and to the side of that is a storage facility. And that piece of property has a fenced-in area for the storage units that they have. Um, the owner there owns the property in front of the other house, which is a triangle, and he's willing to sell it. He's also willing to sell the entire business. So it would be up for your consideration to take a look at that to say, does this property make sense for the school system, for the county? It probably, if you're looking at a larger site, that would be 
hundreds of acres or 100 acres. This 10 acres is going to certainly going to cost you less to get it in preparation. The facilities are there. It might make sense. So I ask you to consider it. Considerate it. Uh, if you need more information on it, I've got a slide presentation. I'd be happy to meet with any of you and give you the details. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, Sam Moser has signed up to hear about trash on the highway. Right? So I can speak? No. So no, I'm asking you, you want it to <laughs> unrelated to the agenda, correct? <clears throat> okay. And then uh, Carson Heartbreaker, Raider. Carson Heartbreaker signed up to speak on the Hido. Is she here? I've seen her go by a while ago. Is she in the overflow room? Great. <laughs> morning. Good morning. My name is Carson Harkrader. I'm the CEO of Carolina Solar Energy. We're a solar energy company based in Durham at 400 West Main Street. And uh, it's nice to be here again. We appreciate that you all are going to um, have a look at solar energy facilities in the Hido today. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention is I know there is a possibility that they may also in the future uh, have a look at a solar ordinance specifically for solar. Um, as we move forward with our processes, it's very helpful if there's no moratorium in between. So in other words, if solar continues to be able to operate under the current ordinance, and then when, if there is in the future a solar ordinance, if that comes in without any moratorium on solar in the interim, uh, that's very helpful for us in all of our processes. So that's my small comment, and thank you very much. Thank, Great. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we will, I'm sure, address the points that y'all have raised when we come to those items on the agenda, but does any commissioner have a response at this time? Let's wait. Okay, so... I have, I have one thought. It brought to my attention this uh, weekend a, a potential issue with the uh, ordinance as it's written for Class 1 and would relate to solar. If a if a farmer had 200 acres and he wanted to put, and this might be a question for Mr. Albright, and he wanted to put a five acre solar farm in the middle of that 200 acres, hypothetically, would he then have to put a 150 foot border all the way around his 200 acres by this ordinance? Can we address that when we come to the agenda item? Because it's sure. not really related to what the, the speaker <coughs> said. So can we you can make that right that? now. Um, gives Claude some time to talk over that. Okay, so the next thing on our agenda is to approve the agenda. I have a couple of things I know that we want to change. Uh, two motions to amend the agenda. The first would be my motion uh, to add an agenda item before the public hearings. Uh, we have uh, John Dooley from Elon is here to present a certificate of commendation to our health department from uh, President Connie Book from Elon. So I would make a motion to amend the agenda to add that agenda item. Second. So we have a motion and a second to add that agenda item. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, and then I think somebody else had a motion to make. Yeah, I want to make a motion that we pull off the uh, sanctuary city uh, second amendment and vote on it individually. Okay, so your motion is to take consent item uh, uh, 6B, yeah. the Sanctuary County Resolution, and move that to uh, number eight somewhere, presentations, other business. <coughs> um, I'll second that. No well, offense, it's hard to imagine a guy on consent to start with. Was well, it on consent? What, what, it what is. the news media is going to do? Nobody and my family is try to hide this thing and say that we're trying to hide it. We're not trying to hide it. I, for one, am proud to be a Second Amendment uh, person. I, I believe that we have the right to own guns and uh, defend our families and homes. The reason it's on consent is because I asked everybody to review the. Um, I hear you. I'm just now realizing it's on consent, Madam Chair, okay. and I'm making my comment. All right. Thank you. So we'll, we'll move it to presentations of the business, and 
we shall put it, I mean, I know we have a lot of people here waiting for different items to come up, and we try to be uh, aware of people's time. So how about if we put it between number five and number six in presentations of the business, uh, between the Veterans Service Committee appointments and the approval to apply for the tourism reimbursement grant. Would that be fine with y'all? <coughs> All right, so we have a motion and a second to <coughs> amend the agenda. Is there, if there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> okay, then we need to, uh, I need a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So I move. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. If there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> All right, now we have uh, amended the consent agenda, deleting item 6B. Um, if I could have a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as amended. If, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, our first item of business is going to be to hear from John Dooley and... Um, I think Stacy, you want to come up too? Stacy Saunders, our health department director. Commissioners, my name is John Dooley. I'm the vice president for student life at Elon University. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Jan Lynn Patterson, the dean of students, and we are here on behalf of President Book and the entire Elon University leadership to commend the outstanding work of the Alamance County Health Department. In September, an Elon student became the first diagnosed case of mumps in Alamance County in at least 10 years. Uh, mumps has affected communities across the nation in recent years, and we were one of several universities to experience an outbreak this fall. Uh, the staff in our University Health Service responded quickly to this student. We also immediately turned to Stacy Saunders and her colleagues in the Alamance County Health Department following public health protocols and also knowing the expertise and experience of our county public health professionals uh, and how invaluable that would be. As we encountered additional cases, we quickly realized that this was the kind of situation that we planned for and prepared for, but that we are fortunate to seldom actually encounter. Through our partnership between the university and the county health department, students, <coughs> faculty, staff, parents, and community members were educated about the mumps disease, including the importance of receiving an additional dose of the MMR vaccine. The county health department facilitated access to thousands of doses of the vaccine spending hours on the phone, negotiating professional and personal relationships to acquire enough vaccine to immunize as many university students, faculty, and staff as possible. We spent the fall semester in constant contact and partnership to slow the spread of this virus, and the results, results were remarkable. While 15 cases a month were confirmed, countless additional cases were prevented because of the dedicated work of the staff at the Alamance County Health Department. We experienced at Elon rates of infection that were far below the other schools in our region who are affected at the same time. The university and the county health department have received numerous calls from other communities and colleges who see this partnership as a model for all to follow, and indeed it is. Today, Elon University is proud to present this certificate of commendation for the outstanding work of the Alamance County Health Department and to praise the remarkable dedication of a team of professionals who set the standard for excellence in partnership and in health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I appreciate and accept this um, on behalf of the health department, but clearly I am not the one doing all the work. Um, and I have a couple of those people in this room that I just want to say um, thank you to. Um, Christy Sykes, Michelle Gilly, and Aya White, um, if you'll just stand for a second. Um, the health department is involved in, um, the entire health department is involved in, a, in the outbreak uh, process, whether that's us mobilizing and going to the university and then some of us staying back and doing operations as usual. Um, but these three ladies um, most certainly took a lot of the work and the planning. Um, we're responsible for working with Elon to identify the cases, test the cases, and then um, implement the health director's control measures for the cases that were positive. So I just wanted to give um, some recognition there and also thank our colleagues at e Elon University. Um, we can't do this work alone. And so um, due to their not only reactive but also proactive approach to this, we were able to have one of the most successful responses. So thank you all for allowing them to have that time. We're proud of our health department. Yes. Yeah. 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 Y
ask a question, please. You know, I, you know, I appreciate what you do. Uh, but you have the cause and effect process here, okay? We see the effects. Uh, can you can you step back uh, on the causation of uh, what is it the lack of vaccines nationwide? That's or? a great question. And so um, in this particular outbreak, it was not a lack of vaccine. So uh, the MMR, which is mumps, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, uh, for measles, is about 93 to 97% effective. That is incredible. For mumps, it's about 88% effective. Not too shabby either, right? But on a college campus where you have one case, that 12% ineffective comes up real quick because um, college students tend to share a lot. Um, <laughs> um, share drinks, share food, share. Um, and so that 12% is gonna come up pretty quickly. And that's what we had here. So in those close settings, even with a really effective vaccine, um, we still are gonna see some cases, and that's what we saw here. Now through the efforts of outbreak mitigation, um, the third dose of MMR, which is a CDC best practice in an outbreak, we were able to prevent um, several more. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're proud of it. As they said, we're proud of our health department. All right, the next item on our agenda is uh, <coughs> a Historic Properties Commission establishing a historic district boundary in, uh, I believe it's Hall River. Tanya Cattle, our planning director, would you come up and um, just kind of introduce the item before we open the public hearing? Yes, ma'am. This is something that doesn't come before you all very often. It's probably been nearly 20 years since the actual district has come here. So what this is, is came, this was not an application to the county, but instead this was to the state historic group. They sent us the packet, our historic properties commission reviewed in January. And what it is, there's three mill sites down in Hall River. One is Granite Mills. Y'all probably have seen that under construction. They're turning that into some apartments. There's two other mill sites that have been purchased but haven't really done anything. We haven't seen any activity on the opposite side of the river. So this is what the state considers a discontinuous district. Doesn't, the parcels don't actually touch. So the state sends us that large packet you all have with all kinds of information. The important best part is the very, very end shows the map of where they're looking at the district being and pictures of the actual mills. So they're looking just for us to have public hearing. We did that with historic properties and we're doing it here to meet state regulations and the state needed this turned around really quickly so they have to have our comments by February 14th to get through two meetings and everything uh, it's about a hundred page packet but it is just establishing a historic district it pushes up to the state state will have their quarterly meeting they'll send it up to the national level which you'll see on here is national register is what they're trying to get to us a nomination for that and then eventually they'll come back to us for the other two meals to be landmarks in Alamance County and you'll see that those come back for this board as well. Sure. So we vote on them individually, is that what you're saying? We're just voting on the district right now. Okay. They haven't put application up or anything else yet. Okay, so we are going to have a um, public hearing. Public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, does the commissioner have a question before we open the public hearing? Do you have a motion to open I, a public I'll hearing? I'll make a motion, yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second to open a public hearing on this. Uh, designation. I'm going to start with uh, this side of the room. I'll ask if anybody has uh, any comments for the public hearing. Then we'll go to this side of the room. Then we'll check the overflow room. Okay. So on this side of the room, does anybody have um, a comment they want to be heard in this public hearing for the Histor Historic Properties Commission designation? Madam Chair, I'm Mike Hill, the developer. Okay, Mr. Hill, I'm come a big on. Believer. If you have questions, I'm happy to respond. Tanya covered it all. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, anybody else? All right, I'll turn to this side of the room. Is there anybody on this side of the room that uh, wants to be heard in the public hearing on the designation of the Historic Properties Commission? If not, um, can we check the overflow room? Is there anybody in the overflow room? <laughs> Okay. 
Nobody wants to be heard. Okay. So that uh, being said, that there's nobody in the overflow room that wants to be heard. We can have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, then finally, uh, does anybody have any comments or questions? <coughs> Anything about that? If not, we would be seeking a motion to approve the designation of the historic district in Hall River. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve that designation. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. All right, we move on to our second public hearing. Tanya Cattle, come back again. Oh, yeah, it's very useful walking up here. So for the second public hearing, this is something we've done a few times. Y'all should be very comfortable with this one. This is the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance. And what <coughs> specifically we're looking at is a renewable energy generating facilities portion of that. What you have before you is what would be an updated and heavy industrial development ordinance per the planning board's recommendation. And the only change you'll see highlighted is to pull the renewable energy generating facility into a class one. That's um, <coughs> the only thing planning board recommended for now. I think this would be the appropriate time for my question, correct? Yeah, sure would. Uh, I heard part of it while I was walking in. And I, I think I saw a nod from Mr. Albright, but um, if a farmer has a 200-acre parcel and he wants to put a five-acre solar farm in the middle of it, mm -hmm. under the current ordinance, he would have to put a 150-foot buffer all the way around the edge of the 200 acres. Is that correct? <coughs> yes, but the buffer there can be qualified with new plantings, or if he has existing vegetation, large mature trees or whatever, it can be qualified that way as well. You don't have to go in and plant. But if he's farming to the edge and there are no trees, then a new buffer would have. Right. And it, our ordinance isn't clear on which part you want to buffer. And as it stands, that we now use is we put the buffer around the actual solar farm, not the 200 acres, but the five acres. Okay. Well, I think that answered. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's how we've been operating. Is kind of what we've interpreted over the years from all the other ordinances okay. as well. Alabama County is not a dumb county. We do things right. So that, that would okay, keep it pretty simple for them. If they cleared it, they go in and plant some more. Yeah, that question came up. I didn't have a good answer for it. So. Okay. It's pretty simple, too. Um, motion to approve? We have a motion to open the public hearing would be what's the next thing. So. I'll, I'll make a motion to open it. Oh, we have a motion and a second to open the public hearing on um, this revision to the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance. All in, mm -hmm. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? Okay, I'll start with this side of the room. If there's anybody who wants to be heard on in the public hearing about um, the changes proposed for the renewable energy generating facilities portion of the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance. Is there anybody on this side of the room that wants to be heard? Seeing nobody coming forward, how about this side of the room? Is there anybody who wants to be heard on that issue? Mr. Henry Vines. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Henry Vines. I'm from Oak Camp. Uh, in regards to what uh, I was talking about, the 200 acres, now, uh, just a point of clarification, the way I'm reading the ordinance, uh, it's required to have that 150 foot buffer around the perimeter of the property boundaries. If indeed we can have that where the 150 foot is just related to the solar farm itself, I think it's appropriate. But the way it's written, you've got to have that 150 foot on the property line all the way around there. So if I've got my solar farm here, um, <clears throat> then I've got 200 acres back here I'm farming. I don't farm, I farm maybe to most most time you farm within about 50 foot of your property lines. You want to keep a buffer there for you know just for you know runoffs or whatever. I'm going to have to increase that 
to 150. That takes out a, a, a half an acre all the way around my field, which could generate up to maybe 10 or 15 acres. I, I like the idea of, of letting it be 150 foot around the facility, you know, buffer area. I think if, uh, but I mean, I'm just going by what I read at, in the existing <coughs> ordinance, and I think that's going to make a complication even for the solar's, you know, uh, company's name, because as it's written, when you go apply for that application, and Miss Tanya goes to to qualify this, it's going it's clear in there that it's 150 acre, it's 150 foot around the border. So, and the other thing that I wonder, you know, is as we've you know, it's been talked we're going to have a separate ordinance. You know, how does that affect, you know, if I put in for one now and then uh, down the road six months to a year, the ordinance is rewritten and it's less. You're going to have to operate under the old ordinance that you've already got uh, the permit issued for, or are you going to be able to back up to the less lenient? Uh, that's just some concerns that I have, and also in that same light, uh, I'm not sure uh, is a solar farm when a solar farm is created is that take out a PU UV which is present use value or if it stays on the farm is it still qualified to carry that if not if that comes out then you got to go back three years of back taxes plus uh, you go to a regular value so in your discussions I hope that you'll consider that that's a good question Anybody else on this other end that wants to be heard in the public hearing on this issue? There's nobody in the overflow room? Okay, great. So all the speakers who want to speak haven't been heard. If we have a motion to close. Motion to close. Second. I have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, now the next item on the agenda is the actual agenda item to review the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance. Okay. Um, Tanya, you heard all the questions. I know. There's, I think, maybe a point of clarity. So, we're talking the 150-foot, y'all are talking landscape buffer, but the 150-foot is actually the land use spacing for Class 2, not for Class 1, which is what we're proposing. We're moving this up to Le class. Right, and the land use spacing is literally just from the outside of whatever operation you are 150 foot from any protected facility. That's correct. The landscape buffer is 50 foot in the class one. So you have, and it gives examples of how the landscaping should be laid out with double or triple layer trees. For class two, let's say one and two is 50 foot. Yeah, class three was 100 foot. So the land use spacing is 150 foot. It has nothing to do with vegetation. That's literally distance from the edge to any house, daycare, church, protected area. And then the 50 foot is just the landscaping. So maybe that helps, I don't know. It does. <coughs> that makes sense. It felt like we were talking the right. same thing about two different things. Now yeah, his question about present use value, what? That is definitely a tax question, so Jeremy would have to answer that. That's not in our ordinance. I don't know how those are handled. Is Jeremy here? He is. I believe so. He's in our <laughs> Um, while we wait for Jeremy to come forward, let me ask a different question. I remember that when we did the HIDO revision before, that we had to have the statement of consistency right. done. Mm -hmm. And I have that here, mm -hmm. but does this need to be incorporated into a motion? Into a motion, yes. Ma so that would just be that, we, that whoever makes the motion says that it's in, it's a... Uh, There's some bulleted items there that can be read that would satisfy us state law. I'll work on that. Jeremy? Hey, and just for clarity, exactly, I was hearing the question, but could you restate it and make sure I answer the Actually, it was a Henry question. Oh, it was a Henry question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question was that um, if uh, a solar farm comes, does it take it out? If, if a farm is redeveloped into a solar farm, does it come out of the PUV? How is uh, how, how are solar farm. farms that arise on properties that were formerly in PVV, do they get to continue? How is that handled? They have to pay the so, three years back taxes. Yeah, it almost certainly takes it out. Um, we have heard of some creative uses of land where they use sheep. Like you can't use goats, they'll wreck the equipment. 
but you could potentially graze sheep that would go under the equipment if you're spacing it so you don't lose all your grass around it. There are creative ways to do it. If an Alamance County farmer came up with such a way where they could show us, look, we're grazing it, then that would count. But uh, that's the one-off. We've not heard of anyone here doing that. Uh, pretty much, if it goes solar, it comes out of DQB. To say you do have that 100-acre farm, they're only cutting out a couple hundred by it's a couple just a hundred piece feet. Yeah. So you just take that one piece, not the whole farm. Sure. If it's borderline, so if that's enough to take it under the minimum acres in production, it could pull the whole farm. Right. But if you've got a 100-acre farm, the, the rest would still be covered. Is that, is, and does, is, does that fall under the pulling it out, even though it stays, you know, it's on the farm, you mm -hmm. know, the 100 acres is intact, and you take five acres and you put it into a solar farm. Does that take that five acres out of PDP? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And okay, then you got to classify that and you got to pay the taxes for three back years mm -hmm. plus it goes back to regular pay. That's right. Just so that right. uh, farmers understand this, you know. It is a cost to put solar on a farm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just, you know, one of the, exactly. For farmer's sakes, you know, uh, you know. And you may have to start farming sheep. <laughs> the cows will be a little rough. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. Commissioners, have any other questions? Anything else to be addressed? Her answer's there. Okay, well then, I guess since I got the paper right here, I'll go ahead and make the motion to approve the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance as amended. Um, and including in that motion that the Alamance County Board of Commissioners hereby finds that the proposed amendments to the Alamance County Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance are consistent with the Alamance County Land Development Plan as adopted. Specifically, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners finds that the Alamance County Land Development Plan directs the county to promote flexibility in development ordinances to develop cons conscious strategies for proactively managing the type of growth that is consistent with the county's overall vision and goals. <coughs> Furthermore, the Board of Commissioners finds that the proposed amendments are necessary to remove ambiguous and conflicting language within the existing or ordinance. Therefore, I make a motion that we recommend approval of the proposed amendments to the Alamance County Heavy Industrial Development Second. Ordinance. Thank Second. you. We have a motion and a second. If there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. All right, Mr. Haygood, you have an education bond management update. Uh, indeed. Good, uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, I have some information for you to think about this morning. Uh, I'm not asking for any action at this time, but you know, in the past, since we've gotten involved with the education bond projects, we have had some discussions about the value of the county possibly having its own firm to kind of be involved with the uh, process of construction of the school system and community college projects. So I kind of I wanted to take an opportunity. We're getting ready to get into this work, right? It's, it's coming, and uh, I wanted to tell you I, I, at this time I don't believe that that is necessary for us to hire our own firm, and I'll tell you my reasonings why. Uh, we are uh, preparing to get uh, started on the four largest education bond projects. Uh, the school system's largest two are getting ready to kick off right at the, uh, they're right at the very first uh, of the project list. That's, of course, a new high school, uh, which is estimated to be around $67 million, and also uh, the work down at Southern High School, which is estimated to be a little over $20 million. And then on the community college's side, their first two projects are the two most expensive projects that they have in the hopper, and that's the center of excellence and the parking uh, that's been combined at uh, $17.5 million and public safety training center at another $10.5 million. So a, a significant portion of the dollars that are going to be spent are going to be spent on these first uh, four projects. And I think the good news is the school system and the college have both chosen uh, a man, uh, this method of delivery called construction manager at risk. So they're going to hire a construction manager uh, to manage these projects for them. And the good news uh, in that respect, I think, for the Board of Commissioners is when, when it comes time for you to issue the debt for each one of these projects, you will be told a guaranteed maximum price. So you will know the absolute maximum dollar amount that each one of these four projects will cost. These CMRs will be guaranteeing that. 
which is good news. That means uh, uh, they're taking on that risk and that responsibility of making sure those projects come in at whatever dollar amount they tell you when you issue the debt. And uh, I've also had discussions with Dr. Benson and Dr. Gatewood, and they have both uh, made it very clear that they expect representatives from their construction manager at risk firms to attend our quarterly uh, oversight committee uh, meetings. We have Chair Gailey and Commissioner Sutton are both on these uh, on the oversight committee. We meet every quarter. TRC meets every month. Oversight committee meets every quarter. So representatives from uh, the college's CMR group and the school system CMR group will attend these meetings too to update the commissioners, the Board of Education reps, and the Community College Board of Trustee reps about how the projects are going, what's happening uh, with each project. Uh, I also think that it's, frankly, I think it's good news that the school system has selected Salmon to be the construction manager at risk for both the high school and the, uh, the work down at Southern High School. Um, and the college has selected Chrisman for the Center of Excellence. They have not yet selected the Public Safety Training Center, CMR, but I believe those RFQs just closed uh, very recently, so they are about to select. Tomorrow, Community College will do a review of the design team. Yes. So, yes, it is. A They're right there, right at it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the major, the, the most expensive projects by far are the new high school and Southern High School. And uh, the Samet folks uh, are, are well known locally. They just completed the Elon Elementary project, which by all understandings that I have went very well. They did an excellent job. I've heard nothing but good comments from the uh, school system. Uh, they are a local firm, do a lot of local work here. Uh, they, uh, they may have someone in our representatives here. They have some folks uh, here today. Sure, sure. Um, the reason I'm, I'm inclined at this point to not recommend to you that we hire our own firm is we would have to use bond project proceeds to do that. We've been working very hard to try to keep as much of the bond project money on the construction site. Um, and so I think, as I said, we have some salmon folks here today. I'd like to give them a chance to maybe speak to you if you have a question for them. Again, we're doing community college and school system projects, but the, the vast majority of the money in these first four is going to be with the, with the uh, school system. So can you gentlemen, Sam, I'd like to say anything about uh, your plans for these projects? And maybe introduce yourselves, please. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ken Groovy with uh, Samet, the regional vice president, uh, overseeing the Triad operations. Happy to be here today. Uh, just kind of give you a little update on kind of the process. Uh, as a construction manager, we're really a fiduciary for for the for the school system uh, in, in the county, and uh, it starts in the pre-construction process of making sure that the architects are drawing the, the documents and finding things that might be change orders in the in the drawings and getting those things really scrubbed on the front end and then managing the process all the way through uh, through construction and, and post construction we had a very successful project at Elon Elementary as you, as you all may well be aware and didn't have really any issues and you know this is a, a, a county that that uh, is dear to our heart we do a lot of work here in Alamance County and we're here to, to make sure that these projects are brought in under budget, on time, and, and with the uh, quality that's expected. Yeah, hi, I'm Rick Davenport. I'm president of construction and, uh, with Salmon Corporation. And, and uh, more than that, I'm a taxpayer and, and resident of, of Elon in Alamance County. I've been here over 20 years. And I'm proud to say that, that Ken and his group are, are some of the best construction managers in the you know in the area for sure and, and we have a long track record of delivering on time under budget we'll do that for you uh, here as well and and I think the, the great thing about this process is the amount of time that, that we're going to have on the pre-construction effort like Ken said we're going to work all the bugs out of the system out of the projects and and do a, a very good job for you so I think I think from a contractual standpoint and, and, uh, and an operational standpoint, you're in good hands. Thank you. And I'll make it clear to Sammy, we'll be working for the school system, but again, uh, I've been assured that they would be available for the oversight committee meeting uh, uh, that are held every quarter. And then I'm sure if the commissioners or county staff have any questions, uh, they, they're always uh, very responsive. So uh, again, there's, uh, and, I, and I'm, I have no doubt that the groups that the community college select uh, we'll do the same. I know that they'll attend our oversight committee uh, meetings too. Those projects 
just uh, from a financial perspective, the new high school is the is the big project. So uh, I, I was glad to hear that Sanit will be on the job. I think that they will help the board ensure the money is spent wisely and that the projects are done correctly because I believe they really do have a stake in making sure that happens. So, uh, well, they did an absolutely excellent job on Elon Elementary. That is a beautiful <coughs> facility. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask a question, please? And uh, Dr. Benson, I don't believe you were on board when this took place. I'm not sure if Todd, if you were involved in it or not. Uh, but when I went over to SeaTech to uh, look at that school uh, facility, it's been it's, it's stuck in my crawl ever since I saw it, and I haven't gotten good answers uh, about it as far as uh, what caused it and what, was, uh, what to what degree it's a problem or will be a problem or how to how to address it. But there was a crack in the floor that went across the balcony, the mezzanine, whatever, in through under the wall into a classroom. And a teacher in there told me, she said, this is a brand new building, as far as I was concerned. And she said, I can't even push a cart across the floor because I'm afraid it'll flip on the crack. Whatever, what did we ever do about that? What caused it? What, what did people said about it? I mean, I want to make sure, at least why, another, I can tell you yeah. another 10 months here that, that we've got those questions answered and addressed. Can you say something about that? Okay, that was prior to my opportunity to take over this role. We've had two structural engineers to look at it uh, for future issues. Uh, they say that it is a natural crack. It's much wider than what they would have expected. It's been filled. Uh, we've got to, in the near future, uh, either readdress the crack with another field or look for a better option to fix it. He said it was natural? He said concrete cracks, the answer I got. If they got an expansion joint, they don't crack. Yeah, they do. Well, I'm got it. I got a background in the construction. We guarantee them in our house. That ain't natural. That <laughs> ain't natural. Like I said, that was prior to my time as far as looking at plans and doing anything with the system as far as construction went. That crack on the mezzanine about so wide you could roll a crayon. Is there a lift in that crack, Todd, on one side or the other? It, it appears to be flat. It's, so it's just, a, it's not a structure. No, no, it's not doing this. That's what structural engineers have told us if it drops yeah. down one way or the other. Uh, what we are considering uh, is getting someone to cut it and put a piece of the, the flat metal expansion underneath it. So it actually. The crack's still there, but the crack is not visible and it doesn't become a tripping hazard or a, a rolling court hazard. Was that the only one in the building? <coughs> <coughs> it's the only significant one. There's some, um, I'll call it like spider web type cracks uh, in some of the areas, but they're not the, they're just <coughs> the surface cracks. Commissioner Sutton, if, um, if Todd would like, we're happy to go over and take a look at it and just put another set of eyes on there and see what we can. Well, thank you, Mr. That's all I have. But at this point, we're not going to move forward with the attempt to retain anybody specifically for the county, and we'll continue to uh, work the school system and the community <coughs> college, uh, on these projects. Great, Tom. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate this information. Um, I know that when we were campaigning in 2018, um, that I said that you know, we would make sure the county had oversight of what was going on with the <coughs> money. And we have several levels of oversight in different ways. But to find out that we don't have to hire somebody and spend county dollars to, that there is a way to construct the process that we can trust Samet and know that we have a great partner, but also the um, structure of the construction manager at risk model makes it so that you don't have to ha have a third pair of eyes on everything, so. I agree. I, I was in the same boat, same issues in my campaign, so. And they were very, very pleased that we engaged mm -hmm. these folks. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage anybody, if you have a question about that, to follow up with me personally, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. I'm sure Commissioner Carter would. Yes, indeed. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item is uh, the new high school land acquisition. Oh, boy. Never read all Goodies, goodies. 
Yeah. What are you bringing in for lunch? <laughs> Yes, sir. about whether or not his property would be suitable. Before you get elbow deep into talking about the property that you selected, could you mind taking a minute to address that gentleman's, uh, Tom Stewart's remarks? Let me just get my stuff organized here. Okay. Um, I did hear his remarks. I've not actually laid eyes on the uh, property he is discussing. Uh, it appears there's a substantial, I mean not a non-substantial amount of land there just to hide this property. It appears it's attached to the back side of the park is kind of what I'm assuming. Right. Is that correct? And the park is one of the pieces of property that we had the Simmons group to look at to see if it was feasible for a new high school and it was not high on the rankings. Uh, due to water and sewer availability, due to just the geo of the land, if you ever done land, it really steps off pretty steep in the back side of the property. So that was uh, one reason that we looked at it, we considered it, uh, but then we moved on to other property. If you're aware of construction at all, site selection is going to be the key to keeping costs down. Uh, we need water and sewer in extremely close proximity. We have to have enough water to operate the um, fire systems. Also, road frontage is important, plus the amount of acreage. That can be considered billable acreage. Uh, we've, you know, across this county, we have issues with cars sitting on highways. I've got four, I think, I believe four, maybe five DOT studies going on now of how we can remedy some of these issues because it does create a safety issue for our students and for our families. So, you know, our goal was to find a piece of property that we had to do the least amount of work on as far as <coughs> the grading piece because that's an unknown. Also was water, sewer, and very close proximity because we are responsible for running that water and sewer. And also to make sure we had a water main large enough to handle the fire suppression system. So, It's a, I'm sorry, is 10 acres big enough for the new high school in itself? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, it takes, you need 50 to 75 acres to get everything <coughs> on the same piece of property. Uh, the more you have, the better off you are as far as staging cars, getting people off the road, future. You know, just like myself had a conversation about future use of the property. Can you put another school on the property if you need to? Can you expand it? You know, so that's a key. If you look at where we're now, you've got uh, Eastern that we're landlocked. There's nothing else we can do there other than the small addition that we're looking at doing. How many acres do we have at Eastern? Do you know? I believe 30, I think 35 is Eastern, and there's like another 20 for Woodlawn, I believe that's correct. And Western only has 35 acres. I, that's one I know for sure because they actually have their softball field off campus. Their softball field is at the middle school. I mean, it's not far, but it's still off campus. And you know, Williams, although we have the large front lawn and there's a lot of historical values on the front lawn, uh, we have softball and tennis and other events off campus as well. So our goal would be to create a campus that we could put all these events on one campus. Mm -hmm. Students aren't moving, it saves you on activity buses. It's also the risk of running from point A to point B uh, anytime you have a student, especially high school students drive. All right, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I handed you several pieces of paper here. Uh, the first one you may have, it says the Timmons Group at the top. These are the seven sites that were selected. 
Uh, these sites were selected through the Timmons group when we showed them the proximity of where we need to, or where we need the school. This is property that was may or may not be available in the proximity of the school. Uh, this has been shared by our school board, so some of you may have seen this ahead of time. Uh, if you notice, there are several. That was yes, no, yes, no. Uh, site number seven appeared to be the best fit for our new high school. Again, you've got waterline on the frontage, sewer on the rear of the property. General Rowling topography, gas easement, bisex rear of site. So we have gas, we have water, we have sewer, we have all utilities. The property is relatively flat. There are two homes on the property that uh, are aged. So we had we have engaged with that particular family. If you go to the other packet that says SNC Highway 119 site. This is the full study we asked Timmons to do. There's three actual pieces of property. They're all owned basically by the same landowners. Uh, it looks at our setbacks, it looks at all our buffers. Uh, it talks about the topography of the land. Um, there's not a lot of trees on the land, so that's one thing we don't have to pay as far as clearing. It's actually being used for farmland now. Uh, if you look at the utility report, everything utility, transportation, there's the existing road frontage. They went through the stormwater management. As you flip through, then they have the maps of the land and aerial photographs and all the good stuff of the land. If you turn to the aerial photograph, you notice the land does have a large piece of road frontage. It goes deep into the property, uh, really an ideal setting for a school. Then the last document, the largest document that was handed out, is actually the land appraisal. The market value of this land on October 23rd, 2019 was determined to be $2,260,000. Are these maps uh, aerial numerically one through seven? Seven yeah, back. Okay, okay, good. Because I don't see the number on there. Maybe. Yeah, I need glasses. Glass. Very glass. yeah, I brought my glasses this time to book. <laughs> Are any of the sites, uh, just a quick question, uh, the uh, site that was looked at for, uh, what was it, two schools in Nevin, uh, Alexander, what's that? Garrett and Hallfield. Yeah, Garrett and Hallfield, yeah. Well, you know, they were originally looking at a site near Graham uh, versus where it went, and I supported where it went. We voted on it. It was three to two when we voted on that. But uh, it, it, none of this is was the original land we looked at for those two. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. This this particular property where it's located, that's sort of a central area for the, the students that our rear district plan said they're going to capture. So it does create that central blessing moving students into it. This is a lot to look through while y'all are studying over it. I want to address one thing that um, might come up. It's not really relevant, but I'll bring it up and address it. Um, you'll see that you may know my main name is Scott, and you'll see that one of the sellers <laughs> is uh, Nancy Scott Fuller is one of the sellers, and she is my dad's first cousin. Her husband, she and her husband are going to be married for uh, a few years. And um, I will say that uh, Erwin Fuller told me that they were interested in uh, working with the school system to put the school on this property. And did I know anybody that they could talk to? So I gave them Dr. Benson's number, I think. And that is the absolute extent of my involvement in any of this. Is that right, Dr. Short? Yes, ma'am. Have I participated in any way in these No, ma'am, you've not been a part. We've not, we've not even carried on an informal conversation concerning this because I need a separation, sir. Right. 
so I have nothing to do with it. Correct. And um, it's that. hard for me to imagine with uh, Nancy Aaron Orr and its many children and grandchildren as they have and other people, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where I would see any not going to be in the wheel. Money from this. I don't think I'm in there with them, which is fine. They're not money. So. I want to be a nurse. Uh, <laughs> anyway, okay. so I just wanted to address that so that the public is fully aware that there is a distant family relationship there, but there is no financial involvement um, on my part, and that I have a duty to vote, and so I will vote. Thank you. What's the from that? Across from the parcel? This is the correct parcel. Right? There's a mobile home park right, right across the front. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, just to sort of get into the weeds here a little bit, we have been dealing with Mr. Erwin Fuller, who is a retired attorney, uh, who is married to Nancy Scott Fuller. That has been my only contact with the family. And we went through negotiations. And then when he flipped to the attorney side of it, which is what he has to do, uh, our attorney was directly in contact with him then with me contacting him upon the permission of our attorney as well as him. The uh, landowners are Nancy Scott Fuller and husband W. Irwin Fuller, Jane Scott Peters and husband Robert E. Peters, Elizabeth Scott Isaac and husband Donald Woodrow Isaac, Dorothy Ann Scott unmarried and Sarah Scott. Bradley unmarried. So that is the landowners of those pieces of all three parcels of property. Can you repeat that, please? Nancy Scott Fuller and husband W. Irwin Fuller, Jane Scott Peters and husband Robert E. Peters, Elizabeth Scott Isaac and husband Douglas Woodrow Isaac, Dorothy Ann Scott unmarried, and Sarah Scott Bradley unmarried. That's in that's coming strictly off the tax records. Yeah, there. So, with our engagement with Mr. Fuller and him communicating with the family, uh, we determined there's approximately seven acres that's in right-of-ways and or areas that may not be as desirable as some of the other land. So, we negotiated that property uh, separately. Uh, we, we negotiated at 15.5 for that, that is, uh, excuse me, those seven acres, but the rest of it remained at the current value of 23000 per acre. So, what I'm coming to you today, and our board approved this in closed session based upon the wishes of the family, which is uh, the way our attorney advised us to do it. So, we've agreed to a total purchase price of $2,142,500 based on the total property area of 96.35 acres according to Alamance County tax records. When the survey is conducted by the school system, yields a greater or lesser property value. The total purchase price will increase or decrease by a factor of twenty-three thousand per acre. Can you read that uh, purchase price out again, please? Two million what? Two million one hundred forty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Thank you. For how many acres? Ninety-six. Ninety-six point three five. Ninety-six point three five plus or minus. Yeah, when the survey is done, when we will have a firm number. And they're currently, we've got permission to be on the property and they're currently <coughs> conducting that survey. One of my favorite things about this uh, particular piece of property is if you look at the last uh, uh, GIS image on the back, you'll see that it's got a lot of houses around it. It's, it's uh, nestled in some pretty substantial development already. And what I like about that is that we're not taking something that's out in the middle of nowhere and plopping a high school down in it, and then everybody has to drive to it. This could, and I hope that your architects will look at walkable um, models for the layout of the property, <coughs> where people are encouraged to bike or walk to the new high school, and then it becomes part of an integrated community instead of being sort of by its um, design being I isolated. There's not physical barriers to people being able to get to the high school property. Yes, ma'am. We'll make sure that's uh, taken into consideration. Now, 119 is two lanes right there, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Have, have you talked with the uh, We're team? Because I know that you're going to have an influx of a lot of traffic. Tim and Group is currently doing that study for us with DOT. Uh, we are fully aware we'll more than likely we'll have to turn one There's already issues at Alexander Wilson. Correct. And we also so, have them evaluating I mean, that piece of property, too. Plopping them together like that's going to need some 
You bring up the Alexander Wilson. Um, not only have they started the evaluation, they've already started plans to uh, with DOT working directly with DOT and DOT funding to put some extended parking, extended driveway in. Mm -hmm to take care of that issue on 1954 because we shut down that intersection at certain times of the day. The DOT's been having a little bit of trouble with the funding recently. Is that something they think they can move us close we, to the top on? We, we feel like we're we feel like pretty good standards with DOT right now. I know that I'm at Northwest Guilford, Greensboro, and it's got two lanes that go by mm -hmm. high school. It's got 2,000 kids in it. Virtually, and you'd be shocked at the wrecks of the kids coming out of that parking lot on a straight road. And uh, it's uh, and that question I had on my right. list as well. And probably the most unique situation I've ever seen, though, in Greensboro, they have three schools. They have, I think of the names, I don't know, what, what, Southwest Guild, uh, the middle school, and the elementary school. Three <laughs> side by side. And they have a one way street that's double lane that swings by all of them. And you have to go out. There's nobody coming towards you. It, it's probably the most easily facilitated facility they, I mean, they've yeah. got. You go in the right way and you just yeah. keep going. Two <laughs> lanes in front of Northwest <laughs> Guilford is really bad. It, it's tight. It, it's up west. It's just unreal. Right. And I hope we don't have that problem. Well, that's what we're really hoping with Santa coming along early on as well. They can assist us in making sure we evaluate it in that terms as well because that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion that we move to approve the price to be paid by the Alamance Burlington Board of Education for the purchase of approximately 96.35 acres of property on North Carolina Highway 119 in the amount of two million one hundred forty two thousand five hundred subject to the adjustment either upward or downward from Suzume ninety six point three five acres based upon the results of the board surveying using a cost factor of twenty three thousand per acre. That is a motion. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Always a pleasure. Okay, now we have a reimbursement resolution. Susan Evans. Well, Ms. Evans is out today, so uh, and I get to, to carry the water for her while she's out. Uh, you have in your packet, commissioners, a new reimbursement resolution between Alamance County and the Alamance Grown School System. This a uh, new resolution would replace the one approved by the Board of Commissioners on April 15th, 2019. The original resolution uh, was for uh, up to $3 million, and the new one in your packet uh, is a reimbursement resolution up to the amount of $7,448,926. So we're proposing to increase the amount that we would front for the school system uh, by that dollar amount up to 7.4 million. We now know the, obviously we know the accurate land costs and the school system has uh, uh, made us aware of the cost that it's going to take to make sure that land does check out uh, for the new school construction and everything is in place. So, uh, and the new reimbursement resolution will also cover costs that the school system has already incurred. So they've been incurring costs as they go. This $7,448,926 uh, resolution will cover all of those costs too. We will plan to, as we were with the $3 million re original resolution, use unassigned fund balance to guarantee the costs, which we will reimburse to ourselves uh, when we issue debt. Well, we're also looking at the possibility of reimbursing ourselves with uh, school system capital reserves that we're holding. So we'll make a decision about which is best, but we will be putting these funds back into unassigned fund balance. So, Happy to answer any questions the board might have. And this do, we, is do we know now with the cost of land what the projected cost of the project is going to be based on the contract y'all were discussing? ABSS? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Do we know now with the combination of the cost of the land and the cost of the con construction contract what the total price looks like on this project? The total price for uh, it's going to be, excuse me. 
going to be the full 67 million that's been slotted at this point? Big part. Is it going to be the full 67 million at this at this point? What will happen with the CM at risk when Sam comes on board and they start doing the evaluations? The maximum price will actually then be established. Uh, we're shooting for 46 million, so right at 46 million dollars for the actual high school, for the building itself. That's where we stand right now. That number will be adjusted as they get further into their evaluations. And again, once the once Samet establishes that guaranteed maximum price, we'll come before you to issue the debt and tell you what that price is, uh, so you'll know that's the max. But you're still working in that forty-seven million. Or, well, correct. 67. 67, the sixty-seven. Sixty-seven million from the bonds passed includes land, architectural design fees, permitting fees. Um, so our testing, I mean, it just goes on and on and on as far as well, get building, which is required to build the building. But when we backed all that out, uh, as well as the CM's construction fees and all that, it left approximately $46 million to actually complete the building. Um, I think a uh, basic question. How much was in the bond proposal? How much was budgeted or thought anticipated to be spent on the land? That's a really good question, guys. Commissioner Carter brought it up. Okay, there's there's two numbers. Uh, I've been pretty firm that we could purchase the land for three million or less. So that's where we stand. The architects put in over six million dollars for the purchase of the land. So, so we're, we're already starting out a few million. Yes, sir. Yes, we're starting out really good. Not only one hundred forty thousand off the appraisal, we're also <laughs> starting off really well with the budget. Uh, so that actually gives us more money to put back into the school as we can uh, continue the design process. Or you could do the school for the same amount, <laughs> and then we don't have to take you, out as many bonds, well, right? You're bond correct. You're correct. If, <laughs> if right. we can get what we need for less, we don't have that to would be our goal. We don't have to. The just because we have pot, don't have to. No, it's just <laughs> we're, we're, in such, we're in such a market of uncertainty. Yes. Uh, so we're, we're just sort of holding that right now to see where we're going. And, you know, the other thing we're... we're we're glad to hear of this kind of capacity because there are, you know, every high school has a project in the bonds, not just the new high school as well as two elementary <coughs> schools. So, you know, as we go through TRC and our oversight committee meetings and we're hearing from the school system, are things coming in on budget, less, more? Uh, you know, we're always keeping in mind uh, projects all the way down to Pleasant Grove, Pleasant Grove Elementary. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that my goal as manager, and I know the school system's goal, is that every one of these projects is able to be done at the budget amount or less, hopefully. But, uh, well, until you have contract in hand, anything can blow up. Correct, yes, ma'am. Correct, and that's <laughs> kind of where we're at at this point. What's the full capacity of that high school? It will have full capacity of 1,500. It will have seating capacity of 1,250 as we open the doors. So there will be wings established that additional classrooms could be added in the near future. Similar to what they did at Elon, I guess? Yes, sir. It'll just be a two-story instead of a single-story right. addition. All the athletic facilities be included in the figure? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's a turnkey job of us opening the door going in using the facility. But just what I've seen in the land there, it looks like it'd be very easy to develop the topo and everything. We're in the process of getting all the boring, getting yeah. the, the technicalities of what's under that ground. I mean, it looks beautiful right it's good now. Good dirt, good yeah. farm dirt. <laughs> what's under? What's under? And that's <laughs> our concern. So, <laughs> we'll the boring rule, we'll for sure. Is this one of those uh, things where we're supposed to read the, Mr. Albright? Supposed to read the heading there? Yes. Well, that's a quick question. Uh, we're still looking at interest rates between mm -hmm. three and four percent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we vote. Uh, you know, we've issued debt recently through some installment loans, and we're seeing still good, favorable interest rates. Uh, so I think our plan called for four and a half percent. We were we were uh, conservative, estimating it would be a little bit higher. So the better interest rate we can get, the further we can stretch these these dollars. So that's good news. That's right. So this is the Valdez County. I'll be interested in buying some bonds, right? Yes. Yes. Solid investment. I would like to make a motion on this resolution of the Board of Commissioners for the County of Alamance, North Carolina, to declaring its intention to reimburse said county from the proceeds of one or more tax exempt financing for certain capital expenditures. Second. Is that adequate for purposes? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. And thank you, ma'am. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? I want to say this, 
I see what other people are getting for less money, and I'm not impressed. Uh, I don't care. Charter schools, not against them, but I see what they're putting in uh, schools in more rural counties. I drive by and look at them. And if you, you ride by a school in 50 years, I, I just don't believe it'll be there. I mean, it might be there, but it's going to be a process. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Right. You get what you pay for. <clears throat> All right. Well, we have a motion and a second. If there's no more discussion, then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Veteran Service Committee appointments. No. Uh, commissioners, you have uh, before you applications from nine individuals that have volunteered to serve on the county's Veteran Service Committee. Uh, we, the Veteran Service Department is authorized to have a Veteran Service Committee, but there is not one in place. There are no members at this time. Uh, the bylaws for the Veteran Service Committee allow for seven members to be appointed, uh, and we have received nine applications. So you have all of the applications before you. Included in these applications are ones for Yolanda Kirby, Bernard King, Sean Ewing, Randall Isley, Harold Tyler, Gerald Peterman, Blake Williams, Gary Jackson and Nate Chambers. The board may select up to seven of these folks to appoint to the Veteran Service Committee. So at this time, Madam Chair, it's, uh, if you wish to, if the board wishes to appoint, this is up to I look through this quite impressive list we have of veterans that want to serve here locally. And uh, thank you, Mayor, for stepping up with that. I appreciate your service. Actually, all of these people have served, so thank them for that. Um, I don't know how y'all y'all have any preferences or yeah, I don't know how to do this. I know several of these people. And, uh, <laughs> I, I've got a list. Here. If you would like to listen to it, and if you can agree on it, if not, we'll discuss. Okay, give us your list. Uh, Yolanda Kirby. I think she's here with us. We went to school together. Nothing, nothing uh, wrong with me doing her right. <laughs> right. Randall Isley. Harold Tai. Tire. Tire, I'm sorry. And Gerald Peterman, Jerry Peterman, and General Blake Williams, as we all know, Gary Jackson, and Nate Chambers. 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 Yeah. And Tammy Crawford's here. If anybody and Tammy, questions. thank you for putting this list together for us. Is that, is that in the form of a motion? Yes, sir. That's seven. We had to eliminate a couple of them. And, uh, I'll second. Anybody have any questions for Jim Johnson on that list? No, uh, no, he was. People want to serve. <coughs> Anybody have any comments or questions or anything? I, I just think that's a very impressive list of veterans here in our county. They were all of them. Yeah. 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 Yes, and thanks to the others that didn't get on that. So. All right, so we have a motion and a second. If there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the next item on our list is to address the Second Amendment uh, de a resolution declaring Alamance County a Second Amendment sanctuary. <coughs> if, uh, yeah, we'll take a short recess. If you would like, five minute recess, please. Yeah. All right, if we could, excuse me, if we could come to order, please, and resume the meeting. The next item on the agenda is the um, resolution declaring Alamance County a Second Amendment Sanctuary County. So, open up for discussion. I guess we don't have a, Mr. Albright, did you want to, do y'all want to have Mr. Albright do a presentation read, about yeah. his work? And anything? read what you put out here on this. All right, well, I, I took a look at our Constitution, our state Constitution and our federal constitution. More people ought to read, by the way. But anyway. <laughs> They've heard a lot about it lately. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I've done with this, proposed to do with this, is protect the Second Amendment rights uh, set forth in the North Carolina State Constitution and in our federal constitution, which I believe, personally, I believe the Second Amendment is one of the most important amendments because without it, None of the other nine have a chance. Got to get an amen on that. That's, that's, fact. <laughs> that's one reason that North Carolina, when it became a state, would not agree to sign, the, to sign on to the Constitution unless there was a Bill of Rights. 
the roof of it. So that's why we have them on our plate first in freedom. So um, what, what I've sought to do with this is to be mindful of the oaths that we all take as right. officials, government officials, and they recall your oath saying you will uphold the laws of the state of North Carolina and the federal constitution. It is right to keep and bear arms. We do have some laws that regulate where you can have a legal, a lawfully obtained weapon, such as post office or hospitals or courthouse, those type of things. And the Supreme Court of North Carolina has upheld those laws as not violating the North Carolina Constitution or the federal Constitution. But have, having said that, uh, what I've sought to do in here is see the history of the uh, <coughs> right to bear arms and the fact that uh, citizens of this county uh, gain some economic benefit from recreational use of firearms, uh, whether they're hunting or, or uh, shooting at shooting ranges, and uh, it's important for their own personal protection. So that's what I've sought to do here, and I have uh, avoided the word sanctuary uh, county for the reason that um, it is a personal right that every one of us has from our creator, one of our inalienable rights. Well, I'm curious. I mean, I support this, obviously, but I'm not trying to play devil's advocate either. But what were some doing that would have violated the Constitution, the well, states and or? Yeah, some of the states say, I looked at, I looked at Wisconsin, I looked at the Virginia, and some of the other resolutions, I, I felt like they went too far afield. Uh, and some of them actually stated that they weren't going to abide by any state law uh, regarding a lawfully possessed weapon. Now, I don't know how you can do that and maintain your oath. As you swore an oath, you became government officials to uphold the law of the state of North Carolina. And the federal law, that's not that the state law isn't inconsistent with. It. So try to balance those two in this. And that's why I avoided the sanctuary county because you know the, the sanctuary cities are violating the law. And I don't, I don't want to be associated with anybody that has a violate the law or proposed to violate the law. The sheriff has reviewed this too, am I correct? Sure. Yes, sir. You're okay with everything on it? Yes, sir. What, just kind of tongue in cheek, what, what, what was the state? Was it Georgia somewhere in Georgia or uh, Wart Grove, Illinois, or somewhere <laughs> where they were saying you had to have a gun in the order? I mean, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was in the city. Yeah, was so Texas, Texas, like that. Uh, I think that's yeah, a good law. Texas, Texas pushes out the carry very much. Texas has its own resolution. Yeah. 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 This pretext is I'm positive. I think it might have been Georgia or Moore Grove, Illinois stands out for some reason, but I don't believe it's Illinois. But, uh, I think it's already Georgia. They said you got that was part of the city ordinance. You got on go. <laughs> I don't have the gear ball. Kind of pushes mm -hmm. things the other way, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it's important what Clyde said about it not being a sanctuary county. We're we're just saying that people have the right to bear the arms, which is in the Constitution. Yeah. How much the state motion? And we accept that. Wait, but Steve just made one. So you yes, Steve. His? Okay, I'll second your statement. Yeah. And um. I'll just, uh, the history of the North Carolina Constitution is that uh, the most recent one we have is from 1971. We've had three iterations of a constitution in North Carolina, 1776, 1868, and 1971. And I see that the um, right to bear arms is part of the um, 1971 constitution. So that's, um, you know not that long ago, and it reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And uh, then it says some stuff about standing armies and uh, keeping the military. 
and your civil power. So I think that's interesting that as recently as 1971 that that was uh, uh, re-recognized, recognized once again as being important. And I would really encourage people who are concerned about this issue to please research your judicial candidates for 2020 very carefully because um, the North Carolina Supreme Court is the body that interprets the North Carolina Constitution. And if they find something to be, uh, they, the General Assembly passes a law and it's signed into law by the governor, the North Carolina Supreme Court finds it unconstitutional under the North Carolina Constitution there's really not much appeal to the United States Supreme Court. It'd be very, pretty limited um, and rare. So um, please research your judicial, your judicial candidates very carefully. Before we vote, I don't think this is going to alter the vote at all. But in a few sentences, because you gave us, gave us the uh, Stokes County deal yes. and, and what the judge ruled, can you kind of put that in a small paragraph as to what Stokes County would want to do versus what they were told they couldn't uh, the federal judge in that case, Eastern District of North Carolina, uh, said that the, what what the governor wanted to do at the time in states of emergency was unconstitutional because the emergency rights of individuals would have a law for them. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. 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 The, the, the case is referred to was from the Middle District of North Carolina, Purdue, Bateman versus Purdue, and uh, <clears throat> the governor had this emergency declaration. Um, that decree that you couldn't have a firearm on you, uh, concealed or otherwise. And the uh, federal judge said, no, that's not, that violates the Constitution, it goes too far. And he referred to some of the cases about, you know, you can restrict the weapon in a courthouse or a school hospital. But he said that <coughs> was too far. Yeah, so it wasn't, it was Bateman in Keene, North Carolina, it was Surrey County, and then, uh, then there were three other plaintiffs, one was down east. But one of the cities, King or Stokes, was trying to enact what Purdue wanted to do. That's right. They were trying to prevent people from carrying weapons. That's right. The Constitution of 1868, after the War for Southern Independence was launched, uh, restricted concealed weapons. And that was taken out in 1971. So it's an evolving uh, area of the law, very slowly. But that, that case that... Uh, I'm not going to mention names, but you got political candidates out there on a national scale that probably would say bunk and all that and try to do something opposite. And that's why you need they to already put it in their hands. Yeah, you need to have it in the foundation of your, of, 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 of your government, whether it be state, local, federal. If you don't do it that way. <coughs> And still, those things are open to the interpretation of our judges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'll say, just as a personal comment, you know, I'm concerned about mental health. I'm concerned about gun violence and people, you know, the rampages we see and happening around the country, mentally disturbed people using firearms to terrorize people. You know, I'm, I think we're all concerned about that. Um, but I think that restricting the gun rights of law abiding, people who follow the rules, it's not the way to address mental health problems. Um, we have a mental health crisis in this country. You can see it through a lot of different things. The life expectancy for people in our country is going down. There's, that's a, I think all of these things are symptoms that there's a real heaviness in the heart of a lot of Americans. And um, that's, that's the problem. That's what needs to be dealt with. Not infringing on the rights of people who Available. So. Mm -hmm. We've had a, we've had a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. <coughs> all right, Mr. Baker, our Parks and Rec Bazaar. Good morning, Commissioner. <laughs> That's a new title for me. I'll, I'll test it. I've got a, a small grant uh, today that I need permission from you to apply for. This is a tourism development grant that would uh, give the Recreation and Parks Department $5,000 to assist in advertising and promotion. Uh, no county match required for this one. We would plan to use this to advertise 
uh, Cane Creek Mountain Natural Area as we approach getting that uh, place open and continuing to advertise the Hall River Trail to get some out-of-county folks um, more familiar with, with the trail. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve <coughs> that application. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right, we have a soil and water budget amendment. Brad Moore. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Um, I'm here before you today to ask you to approve a budget amendment that would allow us to budget state funds to complete uh, a current farmland preservation project. You can see there in the material, this total project is around $269,000. Uh, out of that total, the county has 95490 in this project assisting with the farmland preservation. Uh, this will preserve permanently preserve 92.66 acres in the southern end of the county. We have a motion and a second. Before we approve it, I just want to tell you thank you and to the Voluntary Ag District yes. Board. I sit on that board as commissioner representative, and that's a great group of folks, and I enjoy that. Thank you. And um, I know that this project has been very thoroughly vetted and discussed, and everything all the wrinkles have been taken care of so we thank you for that thank you you do a great job all right so we have a motion and a second is there any more discussion <coughs> if not all in favor please say aye. aye aye anyone opposed thank you all right sheriff you have a budget amendment for the jail I'm going to present oh. the financial information, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> 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 oh, he passed that one off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sheriff sure can speak to all the details. There, and you, Sheriff. Do a good monkey. No. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm going to present the financial information, Madam Chair. Do a good monkey. No. But I want to make sure it's clear to the commissioners and to all the public that uh, these funds are coming from the uh, federal government. So. Uh, the sheriff obviously can answer all questions about the program itself. Um, but there's a request in your packet uh, to increase the jail budget for fiscal year 1920, and this would be using uh, estimated revenues from ICE. Uh, the dollar amount that would be necessary from February 1st of 2020 to June 30th of 2020 is uh, the budget amount we're asking for, and that dollar amount is $1,019,250. This is based on uh, the per diem of $135 per day and a guaranteed minimum of 50 beds per day. So this is the same terms that we've had with ICE uh, for the past uh, year. Yes. Uh, so it's the same terms as the previous year contract. Uh, the total budget for the Sheriff's Department for the Detention Center to run this program uh, for an entire year from February 1, 2020 until January 31st, 2021 is two million four hundred sixty three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars and uh, again all all uh, the costs associated with the ice program will be paid for with ice revenues so the request is to increase the jail budget by one million nineteen thousand two hundred fifty dollars for the ice program of course sheriff speak to uh, how the ice program is going or anything like that please everything seems to be going real good in the ice program uh, I think the county's done an excellent job the finance and putting this thing together and initially when uh, I talked with the individuals in Washington DC uh, to renew this thing they were looking at uh, wanting to cut down and I said no we can't do that we you know we don't spend any of the taxpayer dollars out of Mass County uh, we're benefiting from this because we are getting individuals that are criminal that have violated the law and uh, they're taking them out of the country uh, here in Alamance County as well as surrounding counties that are coming in here. As you know, criminals have no borders. They'll go wherever they have to go to commit the crime. And believe me, we're getting a lot of it uh, right now. If you have any questions, please ask. Second. Can we have a motion and a second to approve? I just want to clarify one thing. Um, how many county dollars go into the ICE program? Zero. Zero county Zero. dollars. That's correct. We don't pay any pay for it. Self no maintaining. <laughs> That's correct. I can't imagine anybody does not do this. I also don't. It blows my mind. I've had <laughs> your sheriff enough to do it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the next item on our agenda is public speakers who want to be heard on items that are not agenda related. So going back to our book, Mac Williams, you wanted to be heard. Mac, welcome. Hey, Mac. Good morning. Thank you all for the work that you do. Uh, my name's Mac Williams. For the record, I'm a president of the Alamance Chamber, and that's the capacity I'm here this morning. Uh, and I'm here to speak in favor of the proposed sales tax that will be on the primary ballot in March. Uh, the Chamber Board uh, uh, took this up, this, took up this issue, uh, and uh, unanimously approved this resolution. Which, if I may, I'd like to pass it, pass it out to you. Just take one and just pass it down the line there. Uh, here's something for you guys. And the, it, I, I won't read it to you. It's it's there in plain white. But, but the point I want to make, one of the things that I think was uh, interesting to us as we looked at the sales tax as a source of revenue uh, for county government, <coughs> Uh, is that because of where we are in the world with the two interstates between the two metro areas, uh, we're, a, we're the 17th largest county in the state in population, but, we were, but we're 10th in total retail sales and 14th in per capita retail sales, according to the research that we've been given. And so what that tells us is that uh, we're, we're fighting above our weight in terms of generating sales tax based on population. Uh, so what that tells us is that we are benefiting from our location in the world by having a, and these infrastructure coming through here that we have a lot more people coming in spending money in Alamance County than just Alamance County citizens. So other people's money uh, essentially is a real uh, bright spot, I think, that we can think about as we consider this sales tax. Yes, local people pay sales taxes as well. I'm not trying to deny that. But I am trying to say that we've got help uh, that, uh, that we ought to be trying to take advantage of as we consider this source of revenue. And so, uh, Chambers, this isn't new to us. The last, when the bond issue for the community college was being considered, there was a sales tax on that issue as well, which failed. This recent bond issue that uh, we just heard about, uh, uh, we supported that bond issue as well as the sales tax that was associated with it. We like the idea of voting to improve the county, but we also like the idea of voting for a way to pay for it. Uh, and so uh, we appreciate that you all are bringing this back uh, to the county to consider. And again, I just want to make sure that it's on, that the chamber is on record for these reasons as supporting uh, the proposed sales tax increase. This, this sales tax too would not get groceries. It, right, it's Article what forty six. That's right. That's correct. Uh, and so there are there are uh, items that are exempt from this. Uh, food, I think, is one. Gas is one. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so it's not. Uh, I, I'm not as versed on that as I probably need to be, but yes, you're right. There are there are exemptions that we are aware of that that do come into consideration. Also, people, you don't have to pay any sales tax on things you get at a farmers market. But lots of things. I know that. Uh, so, but, 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 unless it's processed, like if you buy some barbecue sauce, local I barbecue. think you have to pay. But if you buy a watermelon. For my cross, you don't have to pay so. <laughs> <laughs> That is quote for this thing. <laughs> yes. Come out to your farmer's market. Well, thank you, for, uh, thank you for the work that you're doing, uh, for consideration, and uh, for this opportunity to put the chamber on record in supporting this proposed. Meeting. What percentage of, because uh, I think it's high, uh, what percentage of uh, sales tax is paid by people out of the county? Have you, have you ever, I've heard it's about 60% or whatever. You know, uh, uh, Commissioner Sutton, that, that's an interesting question, uh, and we tried to do some research on that as well to get some kind of an indicate. I don't know that there's a way to indicate it through normal statistical measures, but a while, a long time ago when Tanger had been here a few years, you know, I think this is where that's been attributed to. There was a person that worked for Tanger who was 
out there talking about the impact Tanger was having on the community, and I think that person's comment was that as they went through the uh, credit card uh, activity at Tanger, that at that time, 60% uh, of the sales out of Tanger, based on the credit card <coughs> transactions, was it from out of the county? That's what I, I, th I think yeah. that may have been where that came from. But it, it's it's kind of an urban legend now that that's out there. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know where you, you take credit. Validate it but, right but, now, but, yeah. but the research, we, this is the best we could do based on generally available statistical data about our population relative to how, many we, how much retail sales we generate. They, ask, they used to ask for your zip code. Right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So in some things, I think people, for privacy reasons, people aren't doing these kind of things anymore. So that's the best I can get. I encourage people if they're you know trying to figure out whether they want to vote for the sales tax or not. Take a look at your receipt. You know we're being charged six point seven five percent now, and they can't charge a fraction of a cent, and so they round up. That's right. And so we, in many cases, many times. We're paying it, but we don't feel it because it's so small. But you add up all the tiny pieces, and it comes to a big chunk of money. Well, it's one quarter of a penny. Yeah, one quarter of a penny. It's hard to uh, believe it brings in six million dollars. It, 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 it really board. is, and that's 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 adult money. And, well, the, and the board has has agreed yeah. to cut the amount of property tax for whatever comes in on that quarter percent sales tax. Which is why we've said we'd like the bond issues that have yeah. been before the voters the last couple of times. We'd also like that there was a way to pay for it. It's too bad they didn't pass in those times, which is why we're supporting this this opportunity now. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Man. Early voting starts February 13th. I which believe. is why I wanted to be here today. <laughs> Thank you for letting know about it. Really? <laughs> week after next. It's hard to believe. All right. Next uh, speaker is Sammy Moser. Good morning, I'm commissioners. Good morning. Uh, good morning, county employees. Good morning, concerned citizens. I am Sammy Moser. I grew up I believe in the Alamance County. I won't have to tell you how long, but it's been a while. <laughs> and I want to speak about trash on our highways. In 1971, my daughter recently brought this to my attention, uh, Tammy Moser. But to my attention, there was a campaign called Keep America Beautiful. It aired numerous times on our TVs. It showed a, uh, a Native American Indian, an actor named Iron I. Cody, with a tear running down his cheek because of the litter and the trash that was accumulating in our country. It was a powerful visual image to show how litter and other forms of pollution were hurting the environment. I've been across our county recently helping put up some campaign signs for our candidate, uh, Henry Vines for county commissioner. Walking the shoulders of the highway and seeing the litter and the trash, it really makes you want to cry. It, it really does. If any other candidates or, or volunteers are here who have been putting out campaign signs, I think you'll all agree that the, the trash is terrible. While walking some of the shoulders, I thought, well, I'll just pick up some of the trash and throw it in the back of my truck. <clears throat> so I started doing that. Then one morning I thought, I'll take a few trash bags with me. The first stop I made right up above EM Hope School where our kids ride by there every day and have to see it, I filled up one bag of trash and didn't walk 50 feet. That was just one stop. It is uh, told that the state DOT will spend approximately $17 million this year to pick up trash along our interstate highway, $17 million. It would be wonderful if that $17 million could be spent on education or maybe mental health, possibly keep some young person out of, from being incarcerated or spend time in prison. I want to thank Sheriff Johnson for going down to Raleigh and 
talk to our legislators and the governor about trying to pass a budget to bring more money in to help with mentally ill people. Thank you, sir, and your employees. I would like to ask you as commissioners, at, as several ways Alamance County has been number one in implementing a lot of important projects. I would hope and like to ask you as commissioners if you will become number one in a awareness and cleanup litter program. It's a program that's needed across the state. We're proud of Alamance County. With your help and leadership, we can be even prouder. During your commissioner comment period at the end of the meeting, I would like to ask if each of you would share your concerns, your thoughts, and your action that you might take in regarding to cleaning up the trash along our highways. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Okay, that's all the public speakers we have today. Uh, responses. Is the adopt the highway program pretty much dead, or what's the deal on it? You might know, Dr. Highway. Let's um, the sheriff. Do you have anything you want to say? Yeah. We're working on this right now. Uh, we have already gotten trailers and porter johns to pull behind our our uh, vans. The problem that we're working with right now is trying to find the personnel uh, to guard the individuals out on the highway. I've even talked to the judges. Some of them. Probation and judges is sending sometimes 25, 30 people weekend weekenders to the jail, which is just swamping and killing our staff. And uh, I'm trying to get them to, if they're going to do that, let's let them report like seven o'clock Saturday morning, pick like up trash at seven o'clock midnight, or, you know, whatever we can do. To, plus the fact that we have uh, misdemeanors in jail, uh, if we've got the staff to to cover them, uh, pick up trash because. Uh, Sammy, you are right. Our, uh, our roads, I get sick. I ride all over this county and I get sick. And we're also working with our uh, a dump down there mm -hmm. to be able to, to dump whatever we find uh, there at no cost. But people are getting so brazen here in the county. You ride along, you'll see a, they throw out furniture on the side of the road. Uh, and it just it burns me up uh, to see it. So, uh, you know, I might be asking. Uh, for a little extra money for part-time uh, detention officers to be with these individuals with the trailers out there picking up this trash. But our highways are embarrassing. It would be worthwhile, plus you get guys out of jail. Exactly, and, we, hey, and they're wore out. When they go back in, they don't fight. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm uh, in support of uh, what Sammy's saying and would love to be able to do something. I, I've got a technical question on this. On the fines for littering is that a state set fine yeah. there's one right up on Alton Hall I didn't know if that was set by the state or the jurisdiction it's going up to a thousand dollars maximum well they need to get some signs up and they need to put them where you're seeing this couches and TVs and because I right, see that's all over the county yeah <laughs> I saw a freezer chest in the Hall River it was uh, what? On, yeah, freezer, freezer chest, chest. <laughs> uh, wow. on Carolina Mill Road. She come around from Carolina Road to go down the hill around the um, old water tower over to Copeland Mill, and then you cross over the river and get on Graham Hopedale Road. There's a freezer chest in the river, and it's on the other side. Um, and you know we've had right much rain, so it's be hard to get to right now. I was thinking um, when we have a dry spell. Nobody's in it. Oh, the lids open. Gentlemen, if I might say, uh, there are a lot of lot of civic clubs in Alamance County right. who adopt the highway. Right. The municipalities, the city of Burlington, Graham, I know they've had projects to clean up litter. So there is a lot of work going on, but we just need you folks to figure out a way to add to it. I guess that's a lot of work going that's on. That's good to mention. Uh, Brian, what is our policy at the landfill with people bringing 
trash off of these roads? Um, I, my understanding is if it's involved with a cleanup, uh, we have folks that bring uh, do cleanups at parks or at other public properties like that, uh, that we're not charging for those, uh, for folks to bring the trash down to the landfill. Maybe Bruce can tell you. Yeah, we, we've had a number of meetings the past year with the Sheriff's Department, and it's a collaboration on this whole issue. We're going to create a website to, so people know where the where these resources are. The DOT still has adopted a pilot program. They also have civic groups that do want to volunteer. Um, we're going to put the contact information. So if you go out, the DOT wants you to be safe. So they'll give you gloves, special orange bags, uh, vests and those kinds of things so you're safe on the highway. A lot of scout groups, our scout group goes out and does stuff like that. So, you know, it's going to take a group effort, you know, keep America beautiful, keep Alamance beautiful. And that's what kind of we're going to focus all this on the website as well. I mean, it's, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of folks, but absolutely everybody recognizes the problem and it's going to take all of us to kind of solve it. I think yeah. if, if folks can go through, if they can work with DOT and get their orange bags, I think DOT will pick those up once they're yep. done with the stretch, and then they bring them to us so we know this is part of the cleanup. You know, we're not going to charge for it to come in. And we have I, I think it's a public information situation where people are not aware yep. of how to contact DOT, yep. how to do those things. I know Greensboro, they had a big thing pushing about don't pull you grease and stuff down the drains and and I saw it on my TV and I said oh well of course I wouldn't do it because I don't have drain out my front of my house but, well if we uh, can make sure that the county's website can point people to those resources just with links to say if you if you could go to the landfill's website and see a link to DOT's program other civic clubs that are doing that too at least that would help folks find it all in one place and they can kind of pick things sure. that they know yeah, what so. Well, I serve on two boards with uh, three boards actually for some of the members of the uh, DOT and they had approached me and I've approached the sheriff about this issue that DOT is willing yeah. to reimburse the sheriff with some of the cost of uh, county pickup so they, they, have they mentioned that to you in the conversation they're not going to pay salaries no they won't no, pay no, salaries but they, they will probably pay a fee for the, the work and we're, we're, we're already on the weekends we, we're working with Richard out at the landfill. Our deputy, <clears> we have a deputy sitting out there when the trucks are come in with the tarps not open. We're giving them warnings, and then we're going to start writing tickets. Good. That's, the that's problem a good you run start. In there once you write those tickets, is is our uh, district attorney going to see that as a serious occasion, or going to give a first time warning or whatever. Well, Sam, you had asked what are we personally doing. Um, my house, I don't have any road frontage. We have a, I guess you'd call it a flag lot. And um, But I take the trash bag down to Union Ridge Road because people do throw out trash by the side of the road. And regularly I go up and pick it up myself. But I want to thank you for what you're doing. You know, that's really honorable. To, and I think that's what, you know, ultimately there's an aspect of us, each of us, in different ways says, well, that's a terrible problem. Somebody needs to do something about that. Just pass it on you to know, somebody else. If that's you think it's a terrible problem, then get a trash bag and you can do what you can do. You know, that's all. We can all pitch in and help out somehow. I've made my children do it. I've made my boys get out and pick up trash by the side of the road. And they fuss. Why do I have to pick this up? I didn't put this here. And I said, well... If you don't, then it's just going to stay there, and I'm tired of looking at it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not unusual for Jeannie to come back from a walk, and I never know what she's going to be carrying. But she'll pick up whatever's on the road and throw it in the recycles or the trash. So. It would be nice to have some options of us rural people that live out in the country because, you know, a lot of people don't want to go out and pick up refrigerators and tires and everything because when you go to the landfill, We've had this situation. I spoke up here before trying to help another young man that a whole bunch was dumped on his property. Uh, when you go when you go and take a load of stuff like that, you're charged for it. You know, if there was some kind of avenue that, that could be afforded to, toward people that would do the cleanup. Look, I'm right down to the country road and I see these refrigerators and tires and everything yeah. dumped out in my you know, dumped out in my neighborhood, not I me. Mean, Small trash, you can pick it up, put it in a bag, and throw it. I got a dump from throwing it in there. Trash. But when you're talking about large articles, I mean, you can get into several hundred dollars worth of, of dumping fees. Uh, All right. Well, I think that's um, 
Melissa, if the commissioner has something else to say on the topic, um, C. Carter, would you mind making a motion for me? I move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A3 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board and consult with the current county attorney regarding claims made in the case entitled Stutz versus Alamance County. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. In session, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, the board received legal advice from the county attorney concerning the settlement of the Stutz claim and authorize the mediated settlement. So all the uh, business before the board being conducted, we're adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the commissioners chambers at the county office building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.